Happy Canada Day, everybody. I thought nobody was going to show up to this service. I thought they were all going to come rolling in to the 11, you know. The early service loves Jesus more. It's just, it's science. It's science. Or they have kids that are small that are uh, awake anyways, and they just want them out of the house. Um, I'm Pastor Corey, if we haven't met yet. Uh, this is Pastor Aaron. She's uh, in the service today, not serving. Uh, I just want to say I'm so proud of uh, everybody who came out to the Canada Day parade yesterday in the city. What a, um, if you were there, we had over 100 volunteers show up, and it was like we took up the city street, you know, going down there. And the reception of the city, to, you know, to be able to saturate the city with the presence of church and the presence of Jesus is pretty incredible. And uh, then we also had a barbecue downtown as well, and so that was uh, amazing. We're not done yet. This is like party weekend, so uh, there's a pig roast um, at the Petka Farm today, so... Is it, where would people find how to get there? This QR code? Okay, it's just um, east of the Crossfield overpass, so just a couple minutes out of town. And that is like a church-wide barbecue, everybody. So, uh, yeah, potluck, barbecue? You're correct. I feel like it's the same thing. It's not a barbecue. It's a potluck. It's whatever you want it to be. It's Hey, we're whatever you want us to be. So uh, it's great just to come and hang out outside of church with each other, with the people that we do life with. So come on out to that. We'd love uh, if you did that. Bring some food. Yeah, bring, bring some food. You know, um, I was in the truck for the Canada Day Parade, and I didn't know that there was a wavy arm guy on the back of the truck I was in. And I see people off to the side doing this. What is wrong with the city? Like, I okayed the purchase of the wavy arm thing. I knew that it was going to be in the parade, and I, anyways, whatever, whatever. You love me. You get, to, you get to live with me. Um, also, some people are like, hey, God has been doing some work in, in in my life. You know, I was talking with a guy who we just baptized and comes in with his family. He's like, God is doing such amazing things in small group, but now with the with small groups being over for the summer, most of them. Uh, you know, we don't want to lose that. And so, uh, so he was kind of instrumental in starting up like a, a motorcycle club. He's got a bike. And so, but here's the thing. If you're missing small group and you're missing doing life with people, Saturdays at six o'clock, we meet here. And that is where kind of the core of Venue Church meet. And if you want to get to know people, and that is like kind of a giant small group. And then we break out in the creative team and stuff like that. Super easy to come to. And, uh, if you want to chat with us, I mean, we would just open that up for you. It's it's a it's a place you don't have to feel disconnected. See, once you do life with people and you get it right and you do it in small groups, then you hang out with those people. And they're the people that, like, even during the summer, you have over for barbecues all the time. Like, so we can't get enough of each other because we, we like each other. Most of us, we like each other. Staring at my daughter. Let's make it weird. Let's do that. Um, okay, thanks, John. You know, I was thinking about what is it, what is it to be Canadian? Um, I think some people have an agenda to change what it means to be Canadian. I'm going to show you um, that we are, what we really want as a church, and what God really wants, we're not asking the nation to, to follow Jesus. We're asking the nation to follow Jesus again. So that's a huge difference in your prayers and your mentality. But I was thinking, like, what does it mean to be Canadian? Um, you know, there's the normal things. There's Tim Hortons. Everybody likes Tim Hortons. I hate Tim Hortons. Um, but I still drink their coffee because I can get 13 Tim Hortons coffees for the price of one Starbucks coffee. <laughs> I still do Starbucks, too, because, you know, their kids got to go to college. But um, there's this idea that Canadians are super nice to people's faces. Um, you know, then we tend to kind of post online later, like friend of mine hurt me no but like if you talk to us we're super nice people we're easy to get along with um there's um there's if if you have a bunch of you know and i'm not picking on americans i grew up in the states a bit when i was a kid so america's got their own problems so they're just very vocal about them and so you can always tell when there's canadians and americans in a restaurant because the canadians are always trying not to have their voices too loud to be overheard you know and the americans are hoping that everybody hears their voice I'm just like taking little shots. Um, 
But having said that, I think as Canadians, maybe we've been quiet for a long time. I think the next move of God in church is going to come out of Canada. Um, there's something that I think it's our turn to step up to the plate and see what God will do. Um, that's what I think. You know, I think we have to get over some of our Canadian, you know, I mean, those are some of the fun things and, about Canadians. But there's this other like crabs in a bucket sort of thing about Canadians, too, where if we see somebody rise up or God calls a leader, then we're like, hey, why are they in charge? Why don't I get that platform? Why don't? And then we drag them back down to, you know, it's like school systems used to like raise the exceptional kids. And now they're like, hey, you're making everybody feel bad. Why don't you go back down there? And uh, so now, you know, you're Canadian when this happens to you. I was in the Fort Lauderdale airport. You remember Haiti Arise? Uh, Pastors Mark and Lisa were just here. So we were on a trip down there and I, we, uh, Pastor Aaron and I had a team of kids from my dad's church who were going down there. And so we were in Fort Lauderdale airport. And you know you're Canadian when you don't really know how the rest of the world works. You just think that everybody is super nice and just like, hey, we just want to get along. And so I walk out of uh, the Fort Lauderdale. That's where I lost all the passports. There's lots of stuff that happened. Ironically, I'm the passport holder in our family now. Because that experience of losing an entire team's passports burned into my soul. And so now I know where the passports are at all times. I've got them on me right now. <laughs> I don't. I was walking out. So I walk out of a secure area. Now, we did this thing you do when you have a team of youth that don't want to pay for a hotel. You go, you fly in at night, and then you got to fly out in the morning. And so you just sleep in the airport, right? That'd be great if they weren't renovating the airport and making announcements every three minutes about, like, unattended baggage will be, you know, and it's two in the morning. Unattended baggage will be. Now nobody cares about baggage anymore. Yeah. <laughs> Ironically, if you've been in. Anyways. So I walk out, I'm like, I told Pastor Aaron, I'm like, I'm going to leave all my stuff here. I'm going to go out and find coffee. I need a coffee. So I walk out of a, a, um, like a little kind of double door. I walk out. I didn't realize I was leaving a secure area because we were flying out of that wing in the morning. So we were just going to camp out there, but there was no coffee, right? So that's a big deal. So I was walking out. I walk out. I look around. No coffee. I'm like, whatever. I'll go back and get the rest of the team. I try to walk back through the same doors, and these two, you know, giant American security guards are there, and they're like, where are you going? And I'm like, through the doors. And they're like, you can't go in there. I'm like, but I just came from there. It's like literally happening. I just came from there. They're like, well, you can't go back in there. I said, but all my stuff's in there. And they said, it can't be in there either. And I'm like, but it's there. <laughs> like, I said, I have a whole team of people in there. And the guys are like, they can't be in there either. I'm like, but they're there. <laughs> you know, then it got to this place where they started like, don't raise your voice at, at us. And I'm like, what's happening? I'm like, I just, I'm Canadian. Like, just tell me what to do. <laughs> like, I don't know what the rules are. Like, what am I supposed to do? <laughs> Finally, they kicked everybody out of that wing because apparently the wing closes. But, I, you know, I was just like, it was, I remember feeling very Canadian. I'm like, why don't they just, like, I don't know what's happening. <laughs> because I think they were used to dealing with a lot more aggressive people who were like, I'm going to go in there. Do you know who I am? And I'm like, I don't know who I am. I don't, I don't know where I am. I don't have, all I had was coffee money. That's all I got. So I don't even know where my wife is and my bag. You know, um, <laughs> you know, Pastor Aaron, if you ever want to be completely ignored in a security line in an airport, just go through with somebody dressed like a hippie. <laughs> and Pastor Aaron always used to get, you know, the body cavity search or whatever, because she would, like, always be wearing feather earrings and stuff and looking like a hippie. Pastor Aaron's life has, like, everything else, and then there's libraries and airports, and the rules, she's like, we got to... I'm like, I don't think there's a library jail. I don't think they're going to, I don't think they could even physically do that. They're, they work at a library, right? But airports, like, there's so many rules, she just freaks out about everything all the time. My attitude is always like, just walk places, and guys will tell you when you can't go back. <laughs> she's always on our entire family, our entire family. She's like, have you, do you have any water in your water bottles before you, do you have any water in your water bottles? And then sometimes her bottle is the one with water, and then she's got to go back through the thing, and we're all just like, I went through uh, sec airport security with Sean Gibson one time. Where's Sean? Okay, Sean looks like a clean-cut guy now, but if you ever want to be completely ignored while they concentrate on somebody else, 
he his hair was long. He was wearing a hat. You know, Sean is like he, you know, he, he didn't make a lot of eye contact back then. He was wearing a backpack. I'm like, I think I thought he had a bomb, and I was traveling with him. I'm, I'm not convinced he doesn't have one right now. And I'm like, check that guy out, man. And so, anyways, <laughs> um, you know, just being Canadian, always apologizing for everything. Like this is our fault. This is our fault. Uh, I was in youth with a mission for about five months, and our team leaders would every now and again lecture. You know, I remember them gathering all the guys and giving us this huge lecture about not respecting the girls and just being a bunch of idiots or something. And as this is happening, I'm just internalizing this whole message. And I'm like, oh, it's me. Oh, I know that this is me. And I went and I repented to my, and I did this several times. It was the same thing. And my team leader, he was from Australia. And, and he, he was like, what are you, What? He's like, no, I'm talking to the Americans. Oh, my goodness. Because <laughs> every time I'm like, he's like, you Canadians, you guys are nice. To be. I'm like, oh, it's me. I know it's me. I'm such an idiot. Oh, you should kick me out. Um, just, you know, what's it like to be, to be a Canadian? I think sometimes we don't speak up when we ought to. I think we don't recognize that the seed for revival, which has never really happened in our nation before, I think as Canadians, we kind of hope that somebody else will do it. And I think we sort of hope that, I think we feel a sense of powerlessness right now. I think COVID kind of did that in like things, you know, rules. And we find out we, we didn't have much of a voice in this time. Like what do, what do we do? Are we allowed to say stuff? Are we, I don't think you understand that the seed for revival in your home, in your life, in your nation is already in your hand. You haven't sown it yet. Now, Here's the trouble, because you, you don't think that what you're holding is the seed, because what you're holding is often painful, and you're trying to escape from it. When God is looking at it, he's like, that's the seed for revival. And you're like, I just want you to fix this. This is not working. There's something that... Has revival ever historically broken out? A revival is when a city or a nation comes back to God, comes back to Christ. Now... Has it ever broken out in good circumstances? I agree to the Bible. What are you hoping for? That revival, that every, the circumstances will fix themselves and then a move of God will come? I would challenge that and say, I don't think that that's the field that revival grows in. I think the field that re revival grows in, you know, because we're Canadian, we, we, I don't know what we think. Like, we're all going to wake up one morning and, like, all come out of our houses and look at each other and hold hands and sing Kumbaya or the song in the Grinch. You know? We just start, like, singing. Like, and we'll just wake up one day and we'll just all want the right thing. You know, because that would be easy. What's that beeping? Somebody's car alarm is going off. Everybody leave the church right now. <laughs> <laughs> they'll, they'll let us know. Oh, it's gone. Is it my car in the back? Oh, somebody got it. Crystal's car. Oh, Crystal's car. It always does this. Okay, sorry. You can't distract me. Let's get back into it. Okay. There's a word... That is the enemy of revival. It is a word that we love that we should hate. It is the reason that we need revival. It is the reason that we are following our own path and that we are highly suggestible to other gods and other gods' agendas. It is a word that we love that we should hate. We wish that this was a seed that we could sow, but it's not. Um, it creeps in and makes prisoners of smart people it creates a society that teeters on the cliff of stupidity. It is at the heart of unjust laws, a complete lack of judging the tree by its fruit. It's the reason that we need revival. The word is not sin. The word is not a bad economy. The word is not a bad school system. The word is not a bad government. The word is not your husband. <laughs> Say amen, ladies. The word is comfort. Comfort. 
Comfort makes good people do nothing. You know how they used to um, take over indigenous populations? They would bring gifts with them and get them used to the stuff so that if they left, they don't get the stuff. See, before that, you don't know and you wouldn't accept an oppressor coming in. You know what I'm saying? You see, you get used to the stuff. You get used to the comfort. You get used to a better quality of life. And then it gets threatened. You're like, oh, well, no, okay, you stay then. That's what happens personally in our homes. You get a little stuff, you know. You don't know what it's like to lose something until you have something. Right? Some people think that, I think that rich people and poor people can have a love of money. But I don't think stuff or money, God is like, I am your source. Why, why do you care what you have or what you drive? Like, relax. If the, if the flowers aren't worried about it, what are you worried about? You people of little faith. But the more stuff we have, the more stuff we have to lose. This is, this is historically, read back in Israel, it's typical in any nation, is what happens is that a nation gets comfortable because of the blessing of God, like we did in Canada. You know, our grandparents came under duress. My grandparents, maybe your great-great-grandparents if you're very young. You're a young pastor. Yeah, pastor, you look super young. And then God forms a nation based on his rule and his right to rule. And then gives us a lot of stuff. And then we're like, thanks for all the stuff. Now we don't need you anymore, I guess. So Israel, it would just happen to them in this lifestyle of just generations, just typical. So Israel would get comfortable. As Israel gets comfortable, it starts casting around for other gods. Because you get further from survival and further from like actually having to evaluate the fruit of the tree. We don't evaluate the fruit of anything anymore right now. We don't even wait around long enough. We just get mad about it and like, well... Well, it's, it's because we've been so comfortable for so long. You know, our grandparents, my grandparents couldn't wait that long to evaluate the fruit. They had to think ahead of their actions now, which were going to affect them tomorrow. But who cares tomorrow if you get bailed out, right? And so, so what happens is Israel gets soft. Israel starts seeking other gods. They're the same gods. They're the same gods of economy. They're the same gods of sex. They're the same gods of sex and religion. Don't think that sexuality is outside the realm of religion. It just might not be Christianity. There are other... Anything the devil can use... Listen, the devil can't beat the army of God. It can... He can suggest that we get comfortable. That's the way to beat us. He can't beat us. I mean, who can beat the commander of the Lord's army? Who can beat Jesus? He can't beat a mobilized church. He can beat us if he gets us addicted to comfort. And so then, then we search after other gods, and then God's like, I can't protect you out there. I protect you in here. This is, here's the house rules. Here's what we got to do to live with each other, to eat and live indoors. I'll protect you here, but I can't protect you out there. And so then captivity comes, and another nation comes in stronger than them. Without the help of the Lord, you can't beat them either. And then they take the people of Israel away. And then after years of being broken... And watching their children grow up in captivity, which is kind of happening now. People get desperate and start calling on the name of the Lord again. God calls a deliverer and brings about a miracle. It's just a typical thing. And then after the miracle, God gives you a bunch of stuff that you don't deserve. And then after about 20 years or the next generation, we're like, thanks for your stuff. We don't need you anymore. I serve the God of sports now. I serve the God of food. I serve the... If you can't beat him, get him addicted to comfort. Then you'll beat him. That's one of the reasons why when we started the church, we had little catchphrases. Like, discomfort is the new comfort. We're like, we don't even care about comfort. We don't even like comfort. We like it. We like it uncomfortable. Which is good, because I'm your pastor. I had to make up something to be like, it's not going to be a comfortable journey, guys. It's going to be a lot of fun. It's going to be a little crazy. So here's the problem. How do I pray for a politician who's a politician? How do we pray for a politician that we are not personally convinced? I'm not going to tell you who to vote for. I'm just saying, like, how do we as a church pray for somebody that we are convinced is harming the nation? Because it goes deep in us. Like, how do we, what do we do as a church? How do we, how do we, how do I support that? So what we do is we end up doing a lot of posting, but not a lot of praying, because we're not sure how to pray. 
And I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you something, you know, even, even, and I will say this because look, I'm not against our current prime minister. I know that there's an agenda at play though. And he's been quoted as saying, Canada is becoming a new kind of country, not defined by our history, meaning moving away from our Christian roots of our history that I'm going to show you today. So I'm not saying anything about like, he is the enemy. We wrestle not against flesh and blood political parties. I don't care who you vote for, but here's, I want to show you who to pray for. And how we pray for them. Because you can't just hate the other person and think that your party is going to save the nation. It won't. Or if that's your party, it won't. It clearly can't. The only thing that can save the nation is the church sowing the seed of revival. Now, now, how would God get to a sinner right now? There's somebody at your work that God wants to get to. There's the leaders of our nation. There's the leaders of school systems. There's leaders... How does God get to sinners? Because God gave the world to Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve were like, thanks for all your stuff. We're going to go get adopted by this weird serpenty. He's going to make us sick and kill us with sin. And uh, how does God redeem the world? Because there's this whole thing out right now. It's like, well, if God was love, why do all the bad things in the world happen? Stop. Can you stop blaming God for something that he didn't break? He made Eden. He made perfection. Heaven is perfect, right? So you've got to stop blaming God. If I'm, look, if I do something good for you and kind for you and you turn around and break it, then you get mad at me about it. Maybe that's something to repent of, you know, or teach people. If they don't understand, well, God is all powerful. Why doesn't he fix this? Because he gave a gift away. So you don't complain about gravity. You're like, ah, oh, gravity. I fall off here and break my head. You know, gravity, I knew it. You don't complain about it. It's just the way. It, so there's something called choice. God made Adam and Eve with choice. So the only way for God to make justice in an unjust world is to override how the world was made and you were made with choice. So the only way for God to make people not sinful in that aspect of why don't you just come and take over, the only way for God to do that is for God to turn you into a robot and take your choice out. So you're like, God fix all the injustice in the world. And he's like, the injustice that you create too? Unless you think you're perfect, in which case this is the wrong church. How does God fix, how does God get to sinners? How does God change hearts? Because we think that you can't even really change your own heart. How does God do it? Choice comes into the world. Is this kind of helping everybody? So, so how does God forgive a sinful people and bring a sinful nation back to himself? How does God get to your supervisor at work that's causing you all the pain? How does God do it? How does God do it? You ready? Here goes the cold water. m M&M. and Okay. There's no forgiveness. You ready? There's no forgiveness without something to forgive. The seed in your hand right now is the pain and suffering that somebody else might be causing you. Jesus hangs on a cross, releases forgiveness to the entire world, but there's still your choice. It's in a bank account. It may or may not be deposited by you if you don't want it into the family, but Jesus didn't deserve a cross. Take up your cross daily, he says, and follow me. Stop praying for comfort and stop praying for people to stop hurting you. It might be the only way that they'll get saved. See, the world is in its funny place right now. Because when the world tries to fix themselves and society is like, hey, so somebody hurt you and betrayed you and destroyed you, and it'll make you feel better if we try to pay you back for all of those things. It won't. The only thing that can redeem is forgiveness. Forgiveness is saying, I don't agree with what you did, but I'm not holding it against you anymore. Jesus says, if you don't forgive the people around you, I can't forgive you. So there's things in your life where you're stuck. There's things in your supervisor and your spouse's life where they're stuck. And you find yourself in this place where you're like, if they just... And God's like, actually, that injustice is happening so that I have a way for the Holy Spirit to get into their lives because there's no other way. That's the path. See, Christ follower, you can get healed from your past no matter what happened to you. Stop letting the society tell you you'll never be... You'll always be a little broken, but you come to Jesus... 
Like the doctor, the one who made your heart. You think he can't heal you? You think he can't fix you? You can get healed for injustice done against you. The world can't. Jesus, like, would you pay the price for somebody else to? Instead of hating the person hurting you, would you start praying for the person? You can do it. I can't do that. You can do all things through Christ who gives you strength. He did it for you. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Well, I don't apologize to people until they ask for forgiveness. Then don't go to heaven. Jesus forgave you before you said sorry. It comes first. If it's not, it's transactional. Now listen, when I'm training my kids, this is how I train them. You need to apologize, but you need to forgive whether they apologize or not. Or else you'll be drinking the poison and hoping the other person dies. You forgive anyways. That, forgiveness has nothing to do with the other person. It has everything to do with you. You want the redemption of God to flow in your family? Anybody dealing with injustice? Perfect. It's the seed. You're the only one who can sow it. Your boss is not going to sow it. Come on, church. Could it be that the only way for God to get to them is for something bad to happen to you? Some of you are sitting here because your grandma prayed for 20 years. Never saw an ounce of hope or an ounce that you would ever come back to God. And you're here. You think that you earned it? You think that it was your brilliance that turned it on one, online one day and you're like, I'm such an amazing person. I've decided to come and have my sins forgiven. Now you're a hard heart. You don't want your sins forgiven? You're poor grandma, man. Somebody paid the bills here before you got here. Somebody forgave you for sitting in their seat. Somebody asked you 20 times before you came and forgave you every time you didn't. Somebody didn't want to be paid for what you did to them. That's why you're here. Jesus doesn't want to be paid for putting him on a cross. Revival breaks out in forgiveness. I've asked my dad, Pastor Richard, to... My mom and dad are retired now, but we still call them pastor out of respect. He's going to preach about forgiveness again in the summer. It's our greatest weapon that we have. Here's what we're praying for as we pray and forgive. Um, I was uh, talking to Emil back there. Wave at us, Emil. Emil's the giant. If you need a body uh, moved, he's the guy. That's why I get away with saying all the crap I say from the pulpit is because of Emil. Everyone like, if you have a complaint, there's your complaint. <laughs> he was taking a citizen either from South Africa a citizenship test and he was on his way to work with a guy who he would say is very far from God and uh, Emil says hey you got to see what's written right in the Canadian citizenship test this is going to bring you some hope ready is Canada founded upon the principles that recognize the supremacy of God and the rule of law we don't need a new nation we need to go back to the old nation Pastor Aaron and I were just in Ottawa, and this is the Tower of Peace. Can you put the first, the first picture up of the Tower of Peace? This is what that says, inscribed in stone. He shall have dominion from sea to sea. Next slide. Where there is no vision, the people perish. Next slide. Give thy king thy judgment, O God, and thy righteousness unto thy king's sons. So what role do we play, church? Well, you can sit and cry and whine about the injustice, or you can maybe start thanking God for the seed to save somebody. Now, I, I, this is one of those scriptures that I'm going to read that it still makes no sense to me. I tried to change it. God told me not to. I'm not sure why yet, so let's discover this together. I know it sounds like I just made this up like 20 minutes ago. I've been working on this all week, but sometimes... God is, you know, the irritating thing about God is that he thinks he's God. <laughs> so um, I'm like, God, Tuesday morning, I start on my sermon. And uh, um, Deuteronomy 25. The nature of this battle is very interesting. Um, 
Okay, Deuteronomy 25 says, Never forget what the Amalekites did to you as you came from Egypt. So a band of slaves comes out of Egypt. I think most of us would, would know that story. They attacked you when you were exhausted and weary. I feel this in our nation. And they struck down those who were straggling behind. They had no fear of God. So that means that the people at the back of the battle train are the women and the children and the old people with all the stuff. Never think that the attack on the vulnerable that's happening in society right now isn't about the stuff. But there's something about Amalek that went after the very weakest ones. I see this attack in, in the thinking in a lot of things right now in our school systems of like sexualizing eight-year-old children. I'm like, what are we talking about? They should not even be talking about this. We're their parents. You're not their parents. But we wouldn't do that in our home unless we want to have messed up kids. There's so much I can say. So, But I don't want you to get all upset about that. I'm going to show you that the seed you have is maybe the injustice that's happening. Now, you know, my Pastor Aaron had a professor of uh, religion, I think, at the UFC, who said, you know, all you people, all you kids, think that all these other religions and all these other ways of thinking are great. Until Christianity moves into a nation, this person said, you want to see the best treated women and children is in a Christian nation. Historically, if you, if you want to read history, or you can read Facebook. <laughs> Exodus 17, Moses commanded Joshua. This is happening during the battle. Now, this whole battle is totally unfair. They're just a band of slaves. God, in fact, didn't send them through the land of the Philistines because he's like, if they see war too soon with a victim mentality, they're going to go back to Egypt. If they see war too soon with a victim mentality, they're going to go right back to sin. They're going to go right back to slavery. So, but the Amalek attacks him anyway. It's totally unfair. But it gave him a template for the wars to come. You ready? Choose some men and go out and fight Amalek for us. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill. Now Joshua is like the army guy. And he's hearing this from Moses. I'm going to stand on the top of the hill holding the staff of God in my, in my hand. That is, so our main battle plan is an old guy is going to go up to the top of a hill with a stick. Joshua did what Moses commanded and fought the army of Amalek. Meanwhile, Moses, Aaron, his brother, and Hur, that might have been his brother-in-law, we're not sure, um, climbed to the top of a nearby hill. So now we got three old guys on a hill with one stick. And Joshua's like, guys, I feel like your time might be better spent down here. Watch. It also shows that when you climb a hill, don't go by yourself. Go with your small group. As long as Moses held up the staff in his hand, the Israelites had the advantage. What? See, we've been trying to fight natural wars with natural means. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. You're better on your knees praying for the heart of the person who doesn't. So, as long as he held up the staff of God in his hand, the Israelites had the advantage. But whenever he dropped it, the Amalekites gained the advantage. Now, this is where we get to this weird little Canadian place where we're like, I want to hold the stick. Why don't we all have a stick? Once again, God thinks he's God. It's super annoying. It's also the primary job of a primary leader. Help us. The primary job of the primary leader, even the primary leader of this church, is not to like necessarily be on the ground floor and doing all the things that help us. If we don't have help, we're not getting through this. If, we, if you don't show up, we don't know where to go. Now Moses' arms soon became tired because he was super old. He could no longer hold them up. So Aaron and Hur found a stone for him to sit on. So these guys go and grab like a, that's a sizable stone, everybody, because old guys don't get all the way down to the ground, you know, like. <laughs> and the stick is super long, so that wouldn't even make sense. Just These guys, they, they do a job. They go and grab this giant stone. They stood on each side of Moses holding up his hands. So his hands helped study until sunset. Would you be okay if that was your job? Your arms are going to get tired too. That's not your stick. If they didn't, Israel loses. If Moses doesn't, Israel If Joshua doesn't, Israel loses. Who picks the people in the... Who picks the players? Who picks the positions? Well, God does. As a result of that unity and that teamwork, Joshua overwhelmed the army of Amalek in battle. 
So Moses built an altar there and named it Yahweh Nisi, Jehovah Nisi, which means the Lord is my banner. We sang a song about that. He built an altar saying the Lord is my banner. He's like, we know how to do this now. It's a partnership. I think everybody is on the ground in some area. You're on the ground floor. You're with unchurched, unsaved people, hurting people, broken people. We, we all have that area. But then in other areas, we need to look for the Moses on the hill with the rod of God and the right to rule. And we just need to get around and just lift the arms up because if those arms go down, we're not going to know which way to go. And the spirit of God can't leave the nation again. You know, I started in the last uh, little bit because we went to Ottawa. We hung out with RMP, uh, Blake Richards. I think he's going to be here next week. We've asked the mayor. I think the mayor might be here next week too. And uh, Angela Pitt, we went out for lunch with her. I'm starting to realize, you know what? I can't hate politicians. And I'm going to start holding their hands up and start praying for them every day. They're in a tricky spot, everybody. I don't care who you vote for. I think you have to hold up the hands and pray for her. Anyways, God, I pray for her. I pray for I pray for justice in the nation. I pray for But there's somebody here that you've never seen the injustice that you have suffered as something that is the path to salvation. And I feel this right for this group, I feel. Because we've had things happen, I feel. Sometimes you're angry at God for the very thing that God gave you. To save you and to save somebody else. Don't think that the hurt you suffered is without purpose. You can save somebody else from going through that. One day you'll thank God for it if you get involved in church and if you get into your purpose. You will thank God for it because you're going to save a little boy or a little girl. You're going to thank God for all the times that they hurt you because you know how to help people that are hurt. We're not just self-righteous church people that nothing bad has ever happened to. We're real people down in the dirt. And we realize what a great blessing that the Lord has called us to suffer a little for his name's sake so that maybe our nation could come back to the Lord.